Well, we are in the Gospel of Mark this morning. We're continuing our studies in it. We're in chapter 7. We begin it, and we're going to take a lengthy portion of it, verses 1 through 23. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, the people, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is korban, that is to say, given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. After he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? Because it goes, it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornication, thefts, murders, adulteries, Deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's pray. In one of his sermons, John Wesley said, Cleanliness is indeed next to godliness. And ever since then, mothers have preached that sermon to their little boys. They tell them to wash their hands before coming to the dinner table or take their bath and be sure to wash behind their ears. I've always heard that. My mother never said that. But I wonder why, why, what is so special about washing behind one's ears? But... Uh, Anyway, instructions like that have been given because cleanliness is next to godliness. And there, there's truth in that. There's nothing godly in dirt and germs. Nothing holy in being unclean when a person can help it. I like cleanliness. I'm especially glad that doctors do. Up until the mid-1800s, they didn't wash their hands before doing surgery. 
But thanks to the discovery of bacteria and the influence of Joseph Lister, they do now. All of that makes the cult of the Pharisees seem enlightened because two millennia earlier they were washing their hands religiously. In fact, they were such fastidious hand washers that they were shocked one day when they saw Jesus' disciples eating a meal without washing their hands. A delegation of them had come down from Jerusalem to see Jesus when they saw this occur. And maybe it seemed a bit, it seems a bit uncouth to you as well as you think about it, eating food without washing up before doing so. But the problem was not one of hygiene, not with the Pharisees. They were ignorant of germs. It was all religion, but not true religion, not, not genuine religion, not scriptural, not biblical religion. Mark explains the Pharisees' fetish with washing in the first verses of the chapter, probably explaining that for the sake of the Romans. We assume that is who Mark wrote this gospel to, Gentiles who didn't understand all of these details. And so he goes into it somewhat to explain the you know, behavior of the Pharisees and that of the disciples and why their behavior, their failure, their lack of washing their hands was so offensive to these men. He says they were careful to wash their hands because they were following the traditions of the elders. And these traditions were extensive from washing hands to washing pots and pans. They were all written down in a book called the Mishnah. I think I've mentioned that numerous times to you. The Mishnah is the basis for the Talmud. And in the Mishnah, which is full of these original traditions that the rabbis had developed over time, in it there's a section titled Yadaim, which means hands. And it's all about washings. It goes into all the details, the amount of water that's to be used, the position of the hands, and, and how they were to rub their hands together, the right way to do all of that, all of the details. Now, none of this was biblical. The book of Exodus gives instruction uh, on the priests bathing before entering the tabernacle, but the people weren't commanded to wash before eating. And yet by the first century, a whole system of ritual washing had developed out of the priestly laws, and it was required of all the people. Well, that's what happens with tradition. It may begin as a way of directing people how to obey God and be godly. In fact, the, the oral law or traditions, all of these traditions that have been written down in the mission that began as oral law, passed on. They were all written to be what was called a fence built around the law to protect the law and protect the people from violating the law. But it, it is inevitable that very soon the fence becomes as important as the law that it guards, and eventually it becomes the law. So when these religious leaders saw the disciples ignoring their traditions, the traditions of the elders, as Mark calls them, it was a scandal. And they wanted some answers from Jesus. He was teaching a crowd at the time, but the Pharisees couldn't wait. They interrupted him and asked in verse 5, why his disciples eat their bread with impure hands. Again, the worry wasn't hygiene, but religion. They thought the disciples were violating rules of godliness that would poison the soul. So Jesus answers them in three short paragraphs without apologizing to the disciples, uh, or rather apologizing for his disciples. The, his first response in verses 6 through 8 must have, have uh, felt like a punch in the nose. He calls these Pharisees hypocrites, then supports 
all of that from the prophet Isaiah. Now they wanted to talk about tradition. Jesus answered them with scripture. And in doing that, he exposed their basic flaw. They were unbelievers. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. This wasn't a, a mean-spirited response. He was exposing them for the good of the crowd that he was teaching and also for their own good. They came complaining about the disciples. They needed to look to themselves. Their religion was all formality. It was not reality. It's true in, in, in every generation, really. Everywhere when worship is only external and not internal. It's no different from what we see here. So this applies broadly. It applies to them. It applies throughout the ages. There, there is no spiritual life, no reality, when all of this is simply an external show. It's all just lip service. It's just liturgy. They expose that about themselves by coming to Christ and trumpeting tradition, which reduced everything to, to following a list of rules. As long as a person's life was lived within that circle, lived within the, the, the range of the rules, the traditions, then all was well. That was a, a problem all through Israel's history. The people went to the temple and they offered their sacrifices and they offered prayers. They went through the routine, but their heart wasn't in it. There wasn't faith in the Lord. It was just as I said, routine. Isaiah saw that in his generation and he not only looked at his generation, he looked down through time as a prophet to the Lord's generation and he spoke of it. And by implication, he spoke to every generation and every individual that values tradition over the Lord, values tradition over the Word of God. These men were only play acting. That's what hypocrisy is. Now, that's its meaning. In classical Greek, the word hypocrite was used of actors, men who, who played a part and it happens in the church. Paul spoke of it in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5 of those who hold a form of godliness but deny its power. It gives them some comfort, it gives them some, some reassurance, but there's nothing there. William Barclay tells the story of a Muslim who was chasing a man with a knife raised up to kill him when he heard the call to prayer. And some, since a, a devout Muslim must pray at certain times of the day and multiple times during the day, the, the man being religious fell to his knees and said his prayers as fast as he could and then resumed his murderous chase. Now that, that may or may not be a true story, but it's true to the reality of religion. It has no power to change a life. Religion without reality, without life and faith in the truth, in the Word of God, is hypocrisy. Now, the Pharisees thought there was power in what they were doing. The Pharisees thought there was power in their rituals that by pouring water over their hands it would affect the spiritual condition of their souls. Uh, they believed that uh, cleanliness was godliness, that regular water would uh, make them somehow spiritually pure. It was irrational. It was unbiblical. It's really treating the rituals like magic. It's all false and deceptive because it gave them confidence 
that they had the power to make themselves worthy of God. That's the danger in it, which only blinds them to, the, to their condition and their need of mercy. Well, why do they need mercy? They've got water. They've got the rituals. They've got the things that they do, all of the various things that they follow. And so they feel they're fine. They should have known better. They were teachers of the law, but Jesus said they had neglected the commandment of God and exchanged Scripture for man-made traditions. In the next paragraph, verses 9 through 13, he gives an example of how they did that. He, he gave it from the commandment that they neglected. He told these experts on the law that they were really experts at avoiding the law, experts at laying the law aside in order to uphold their traditions. And then he quoted Moses, the, the, the very authority that they claimed to follow. Verse 10, for Moses said, honor your father and your mother and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. Now this is Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. It's the fifth commandment. It's what Paul calls the first commandment with a promise. And the promise that is given is long life on the earth. But it also carried the penalty of death if it was violated. If, if, if a son spoke evil of his parents, as Jesus points out from Exodus 21, verse 17, death was required of that sin. So like the other commandments, this fifth commandment was deadly serious. The second table of the law, the fifth through the tenth commandments, is about man's relationship to man. The first is about man's relationship to God in regard to idols and regard to the Sabbath and keeping it. But the second half of the Ten Commandments is about man's relationship with man. It's about being a blessing to one's neighbor. And the, the scribes supported it. They supported the Fifth Commandment according to the letter of the law, but not according to the spirit of the law. And they had a way of getting around it. As Jesus explains in verse 11, a man could declare his wealth korban, which is Hebrew for gift. And he would not be obligated, if he had done that, to help his parents financially. And this was a practice that uh, seems to have begun, say, a century earlier from this time. When a person took an oath to dedicate something as a gift for God, it was, it was considered sacred and the money was no longer available for ordinary use by that person or by anyone else. The oath might be taken in good conscience, it might be taken for a good reason out of devotion, but it wasn't always taken for that reason. In fact, often it happened to prevent others from using the money. Maybe it was done in haste. Maybe it was done in anger. So when the parents needed help, the money was not there for them because it was Corban. And if they appealed to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the pastors, so to speak, of the people, the Pharisees would insist that the vow be honored. It's the tradition, must be honored. Now, even if the son regretted his action, saw it as something hasty, saw it as a moment of anger. The Pharisees withheld help by upholding the oath, even though Scripture required that a son honor his parents. So Jesus said in verse 12, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. Thus invalidating the Word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. Many things such as that. Well, one of the things very evident that they did like that was the way they made the Sabbath suffocating with all of the rules that they added to it. So restricted was the Sabbath that 
They condemned Jesus for healing on the Sabbath, for doing good on the Sabbath. As Jesus told them earlier in chapter 2, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Well, instead of being a day of joy, a day of blessing, they turned it into a day of not doing. Even if not doing would have been a blessing and a help, would have been according to the spirit of the law. So they violated that. They violated the spirit of the law with the letter of the law. What Jesus taught was the letter of the law must always yield to the spirit of the law, to the purpose of the law, to the point of the law. Ceremonies are not more important than people. When the two seem to conflict, life must overrule rituals and ceremonies. Or, as one writer put it, that which is nearest to God's character must carry the day. In the third paragraph, verses 14 through 16, Jesus speaks to the crowd that uh, he had been teaching, and he gives them the answer to the question that began the whole discussion, the question that the Pharisees asked in verse 5, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? One British writer called them fussy little men. Uh, Jesus was a little more harsh than that. He called them hypocrites. Now he says, listen to me, meaning this is authoritative. And I find that, that quite interesting when here he is speaking to this crowd, probably a large crowd, and these men of authority, these Pharisees from Jerusalem come down and they speak to him and he says, now you listen to me. In other words, do not listen to these men. That's quite a statement to make. He didn't go to their colleges. He didn't have their education. He didn't wear their robes and have the, the authority accorded to men in their position. He's simply the carpenter speaking and speaking truth and speaking with the authority of the Son of God. He says, listen to me. Because what he's saying is authoritative, is true. And then he gives an answer that overturns a religion of traditions and of man-made cleanliness. Verse 15, there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. In other words, the issue of cleanliness and godliness is the opposite of what the Pharisees taught. For them it's all about clean hands and kosher food. It's about ritual. It's not about the heart. But as the Lord shows, that's the whole issue. That's where the problem lies. It lies in the heart. That's the source. That's the source of everything that's wrong and improper. That's what must be cleaned up. Well, that wasn't new. He's not saying something that hadn't been said before. In fact, these men should have known that. They should have known the Psalms. David understood that. It's in his prayer in Psalm 51 and verse 10, created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David knew the source of his sin, the heart. Earlier in Psalm 24, David asked, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands is not ritually rinsed hands, hands that are physically clean. What he's speaking of in the use of hands, hands do things. And so he's speaking of, of, of being guiltless, of not having done evil things, of wrong things. And that, doing the right thing, is the result of a clean heart. The heart precedes the action. And if it's a clean heart, the hands will be clean. So the heart's the issue. And so what's the source of that? What's the reason that the heart would be good, that the heart would be clean? The grace of God. David wouldn't be praying about it if it were not. He's seeking from God what he himself cannot produce. He can't change his heart, but he knows the Lord can, and he prays for that. 
You, you can scrub your hands till they're chapped, and you can go vegan, eat the most restricted kind of diet, but it won't do anything. It won't affect the fundamental problem that a person has. It won't affect an unclean heart. Man's soul needs changing. Again, that was, was contrary to the Pharisees' teaching. And, and they understood enough of what Jesus said that it offended them. And we know it offended them because Matthew, as he tells this of this event, he says that they were offended. Uh, probably nothing offends people more than to be told that their religion is wrong. That their beautiful ceremonies and their careful attention to rituals don't please God. It's an, it's an offense to Him. And we have that in Scripture. He said in Amos chapter 5, verse 21, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. That's quite strong language. Telling these people who were fastidious about the things they did, I hate what you're doing. We're coming to the temple. We're offering sacrifices. We're, we're doing, I hate what you're doing. Now that's God in the Old Testament. Today he says, I hate your holy water. I hate your masses that you think can sanctify or gain forgiveness. I hate your baptisms for salvation. I hate all of your empty works. He says that to people in the church. Whatever the age or venue, religion is the same. Formality, ritual without reality, whether it is dipping in the Ganges or going on a Hajj or fasting for Lent, it does nothing. It's not what God wants. Jesus had made that plain about Judaism. But the disciples were slow to understand this. So when they went into the house and were alone, they asked the Lord the meaning of his teaching. And Jesus was surprised. Are, are you so lacking in understanding also? They were. But the reality is it's hard not to be influenced by the age in which we live. It's hard not to be influenced by traditions when we kind of grow up in those traditions. We all have grown up in some kind of traditions with, its, with their taboos and begin to you, you sort of accept those things. And that was the, the, the case with the, the disciples. They'd grown up with all of these things and now they're learning that these washings and these rituals and all are invalid and they're confused. Well, the only solution to such a thing is knowing Scripture. You know, the Lord doesn't deal with these traditions, really any issue that the Pharisees bring up to Him, but these traditions by speaking about other traditions or speaking what the, saying what the rabbi said, He always goes to the Word of God. Whether He's dealing with the devil out in the wilderness or dealing with the devil's ministers here, he goes to the scriptures, and that's the only solution to error and, and the subtlest kinds of error that we face, knowing the Word of God. And so Jesus explained his statements, which would illustrate scripture. He says, whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him, because it goes because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. In other words, the material, the physical, doesn't affect the spiritual. Doing things like washing hands or eating kosher food doesn't affect the soul. What a person eats is just food. It's taken in, it's processed, it's eliminated. Now, certainly, it, it can affect a person's physical health, but not a person's spiritual health. And that's the issue here, not, not whether we eat organic or whether we eat uh, processed whatever. That, that may, that there's maybe an issue to be taken there, but that's not the issue here, and that's not the most important issue. The most, most important issue is not physical health, but spiritual health. Kosher food isn't spiritual food. 
In fact, the whole dietary system in the Old Testament was symbolic and designed to teach people about holiness, which basically means separation, separation from, from evil. And so God developed this system, not only in the area of diet, but also in the area of dress and all, and the, the calendar of the week and of the year, there was separation. Certain animals were clean, certain animals were unclean. Some could be eaten, some couldn't be. In order to illustrate separation unto holiness and away from evil. So the whole dietary system was simply an object lesson. In fact, Mark adds the explanation that in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. So all food is clean. But this had been set up, this whole system of the law, to teach separation, which is to say to teach holiness. And the law was temporary. It was a tutor and a disciplinarian, Paul says in Galatians chapter 3. Only temporarily. We're not under the law anymore. That's over. It, it was necessary for Mark, I think, to add all of this for the sake of his Gentile readers because uh, to state this statement here, he declared all foods to be clean because from the very beginning there were Judaizers, there were men of the law trying to put Gentiles under the law with circumcision and diet and perhaps many other things. But food is for the stomach. That's what the Lord is saying. It cannot hurt the soul or heal the soul. It's food. It's material. It cannot influence or change the immaterial, the non-physical part of man. But still, that's spirituality or religion for many people. It's the magic of ritual, whether it is kosher food or holy water or ablutions, washings and baptisms, but none of it has spiritual power. John Wesley was right. Cleanliness is next to godliness because it's, it, it is healthy and our bodies are the temple of God, so we should take care of them. And because it's orderly. Cleanliness is orderly, and God is a God of order. But good hygiene doesn't cleanse the soul, and a healthy diet doesn't regenerate or sanctify the heart. Truth nourishes the soul. Truth is what is essential, what is important. That's what, what sanctifies what brings life to the heart, the mind, just as error pollutes it, kills it. In spite of all of the detailed regulations of the law of Moses, that, that should have been obvious to the Pharisees and to the disciples. That's why the Lord expressed surprise at their confusion over this. Jeremiah said, the heart, the mind, is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? It's beyond our understanding. It is so deceptive, so deceiving, we can't figure ourselves out. Now that's the source of the problem. The, the prophets made that clear. This isn't something new. This is all through the Word of God. That's the issue. Not the stomach, the heart. What comes out of it? What comes out of the heart? Not what, what goes into the stomach. What comes out of the heart? The spiritual aspect of man. That's what pollutes a person. Kills a person. That's what needs to be cleaned up. And that's what Jesus goes on to say. Verse 20, and he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within... Out of the heart of men proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, 
as well as deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. A person speaks and a person acts according to his or her nature, according to what he or she really is. Behavior is only a reflection of a person's true nature. And the human problem is fundamentally a problem of the heart, which is the seat of sin. And sin has infected our entire being. We were born that way. We come into a fallen world as fallen creatures who have inherited Adam's guilt and Adam's condition. We need a change that rituals and washings and ceremonies cannot give. We must be born again, as the Lord told Nicodemus. That's grace. It's a gift. It is the first thing a person needs because faith proceeds from a new heart. First regeneration, then faith. If we could believe apart from having our heart changed, apart from regeneration, we wouldn't need regeneration. The fact that we cannot, the fact that we need regeneration is the, the evidence that we cannot believe in and of ourselves. There must be a work of grace within us. It proceeds, faith does, trust does from a new heart. And Nicodemus didn't know that. Should have. Jesus asked, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? So he's surprised at the, the, the disciples. He was just surprised at the teacher of Israel for not knowing these things. There was nothing mysterious about the new birth. Nothing new about that. The, the need for it and the, the promise of it was revealed in, in the great prophets. Jeremiah and Ezekiel both spoke of that. They spoke of the new covenant. They spoke of the grace of God and what he would do. They said that God would give people a new heart. He would, re would remove the heart of stone and he would replace it, replace it with a heart of flesh, a living heart. That which is dead will be made alive is what he's saying. He would sprinkle their hearts with water and make them clean. That's the purifying, cleansing ministry of the Holy Spirit. So when Ezekiel is speaking about water and sprinkling, he doesn't mean literally. You don't literally sprinkle the heart with water. It's a way of saying the, the cleansing ministry, the life-giving ministry of the Holy Spirit will change a person. That must take place. That is cleanness. That is not next to godliness but cleanness, cleanness that is godliness, that produces godliness. It's being born again. That's what man needs. Not religion, not rituals. He needs rebirth. He needs a fundamental spiritual change. It's the first thing a person needs because a new heart produces faith. And it's those who believe, not those who try to achieve, who are saved. They're the ones who enter the kingdom of God. They are forgiven at the moment of faith. Their guilt is at that very moment removed forever. That's what Christ came to obtain for us. And he gained it at the cross, and he gained it for everyone who believes in him. That's the teaching of Scripture. It's the teaching of the Old Testament. Paul bases his, his great doctrines of, of justification through faith alone on Old Testament texts. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, the righteous will live by faith. Abraham was justified by faith, Genesis 15, 6. The Pharisees should have known that. This is the, the single most important issue of life. How can a man be right with God? That's the question that Job asked, and it's the question that has been called the basic question of religion. How can a man be right with God? Well, it's not by works. 
It's not by deeds or ceremonies. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It is through faith in the person and work of Christ that a person in that way becomes right with God. When that has occurred, then works are important. Then when the heart is renewed, when a person becomes a new creation, God produces virtues where before there was nothing but vices. That's the change he brings about. That's what we call regeneration and sanctification. That's, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. He continues sprinkling us, as it were, with water, purifying us, making us like Christ as we study the Bible, as we look into the Scriptures, as we devote ourselves to that, and as we do that, that shapes our thinking and life. That nourishes our souls. The gospel is not against works. It's not against deeds of righteousness and obedience to God's word. It's for that. In fact, it enables that. Salvation is unto a righteous life. That's part of it. That's the goal of it. The gospel is not faith plus works, but a faith that works. It's salvation by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. A genuine living faith is an obedient faith. When the Holy Spirit cleanses us, when He sprinkles our hearts with water and, and uh, makes us new, we have new desires. We have a new mind. We have a new heart. We desire to obey and do deeds of righteousness. We don't do them perfectly, of course. We, we will never do anything perfectly in this life until we see our Lord face to face, as, as, as John says in 1 John chapter 3. But we're different. We're different because of the change that's come upon us. We're no longer content with the old life and its old ways. But even then, even with this new nature, new hearts, being new creatures, a, a new creation, we still stumble. And we still have a tendency to seek God's approval by works. Christians fall into legalistic patterns in which uh, we live by man-made traditions and taboos. So that, that is not uncommon, and that, in fact, is always a danger. Christianity is not that. Paul wrote in Romans 14, verse 17, The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Christian life is not about what you eat, and it's not about what you don't drink. There has to be wisdom about eating and, and drinking and all of that. There must be wisdom about the right use of, of food and clothing and everything. But that is not the essence of Christianity. It is about knowing Christ and following Him by walking with the Spirit and in the power of the Spirit. The moment we believe in Christ, we're justified. That means God declares us to be just, right with Him, right with His law and righteousness. We are fully and forever accepted by Him. And it is all by His free and sovereign grace. He gives the new birth. He adopts us into His family. He sanctifies us then and now and throughout our life until He is finished in that work of glorifying us at the end of it all. That's our future. He does it. From beginning to end, He does it. Salvation is of the Lord. The story is told about a debate that happened a generation or so ago in London at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. It's a free speech platform. And there was a debate going on between a Christian and a communist. As the, as the communist was, was giving the promises of communism, a street person happened to walk by, a person who was dressed shabbily, not very clean. 
And the communists said, communism can put a new suit of clothes on that man. A nice promise. But the Christian responded with a better one. Maybe communism can put that man in new clothes, but Christ can put a new man in the clothes. And that is true, and that is far better. If you're here without Christ, look to Him. He can make you new. Religion can't. It is false. Rituals and works don't save. Only Christ does. Next Thursday begins the Jewish High Holy Days. Ten days that end with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The Wall Street Journal had an article on that by Jonathan Sachs, Britain's former chief rabbi. He spoke of the problem between God and man and of man's failure and and then he gave the solution. He said, it's forgiveness. Well, that seems to be a good answer. And then he goes on to explain, all we have to do is acknowledge our wrongs, apologize, make amends, and resolve to behave better. And God forgives. No, that's tradition, not Scripture. The law of Moses, which that, that man should know, is clear, Leviticus 17.11. It is blood that makes atonement. But Judaism has no altar, no sacrifice, no atoning blood, and so no forgiveness. Hebrews 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That's the only solution. That is the only way to forgiveness, and God alone could provide it, and God has provided it in His Son and in His sacrifice. It's in the cross. Flee to the cross, trust in Christ and His sacrifice, and be saved. He receives all who do. And then by God's grace, live, may we all live, according to His Word and by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this lengthy discussion that the Lord had with these men of religion, these men of ritual, these men of works. Father, you set forth certain activities under the law that were to be obeyed, but they were to illustrate great truth, and that is ultimately man's failure and his need of grace. We cannot gain anything from you by the things we do, whether it's ritual or whether it's moral deeds, can only receive what you have provided in your Son, and we only do that by your grace. So we thank you for your grace and pray that you may work in our hearts continually that we would be obedient and be men and women who live a clean life, reflecting a clean heart that you've given us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for him and what he's done for us, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.